Hi, people. Thank you for stopping by Building Wealth with Rajiv. If you're looking to invest in small and medium companies, you should listen to Jonah. Jonah started his career with Morgan Stanley in US and then moved on to various wealth management companies. These days, he runs his own advisory company. He's also looking to start an ETF for small and medium companies. More than half a million people follow Jonah on Twitter. Jonah and me talked about his investment philosophy, his top picks, and few other things. I hope you enjoy the interview. If you like the interview, please share, please share your thoughts and also follow the channel. This year, I was more about uh, large cap growth, software, e-commerce, digital payments, uh, EV, uh, renewables, solar, et cetera, cannabis, you know, all the sectors that were really hot last year, um, some of which saw acceleration from COVID, you know, work from home and, uh, you know, we can't travel. So where are we going to spend our, our time and our money? And, you know, a lot of that was just shopping online, uh, you know, looking for or spending more time on social media. So Snapchat, Facebook, et cetera. Um, and I did really well last year in those stocks. But, you know, as we got towards the end of the year, I just felt like a, a lot of the valuations had gotten really, really stretched. Um, you know, whether it was Zoom or Peloton or, uh, CrowdStrike, you know, these are still phenomenal companies, but, you know, they were up in many cases, 200, 300, 400 percent last year, but revenues didn't increase 200, 300, 400 percent. So that was a lot, you know, that was from 50, 60, 70 percent revenue increases, but a lot of uh, multiple expansion. And I just felt like as we got into 2021 and 2022, you know, as revenues began to decelerate, uh, you know, we would see some multiple contraction, you know, which wouldn't be good for stock prices. And I don't think it would be anything major, but I thought that there would need to be a consolidation period for a lot of those large cap growth stocks, which means you're going sideways for a while, or you're trading within a, you know, a tight band. So rather than, you know, being patient, waiting for that consolidation, consolidation, I decided to, you know, figure out where I thought I could, you know, find the best opportunities and, and add the most alpha to my portfolio and small cap growth seemed like a pretty obvious place where, um, you know, back, I'd say fourth quarter of 2020 is when I started transitioning part of my portfolio to small cap growth because they had sort of been a laggard to large cap growth. And, you know, not just last year, over the last decade, um, you know, large cap for the most part has outperformed small cap, you know, especially dominated by the, the mega caps, you know, the Apples, the Amazons, Netflix, NVIDIA, you know, even Tesla now, you know, those companies have all done very, very well over the last decade, even two decades in some cases. And there's been a lot of laggards in small cap. And I mean, part of it is, you know, deserving because small caps, you know, they're more volatile, their balance sheets are typically weaker. You know, if they're still losing money, then you're going to get dilution with secondary, you know, secondary stock offerings. Um, you know, if they're, if they're raising debt, they're typically doing it more expensive prices. You know, one of my companies is Mohawk. Uh, you know, they just refinance their debt at 8% plus warrants. I mean, that seems expensive, but, you know, we're talking a $800 million company, you know, if you're an $800 billion company, you know, you're raising debt at 2% <laughs> without the warrants. Or sometimes so, even you know, at 0%. Yeah, for real, seriously. Um, yeah, I mean, some of these large cap stocks could probably issue money as cheap as the US government, if not cheaper in some cases, like Apple probably could. So, I mean, but, you know, with those risks, if you're able to do the due diligence and understand the company and, you know, build out a two, three, five-year model going forward, um, you know, under, understand what products might be coming in the future, you know, what are the expansion opportunities domestically, international, um, you know, and try to figure out where that company could be in three to five years or even longer. I think there's a lot of opportunity still in small cap growth. And that goes for a lot of the SPACs. You know, a lot of these SPACs were popping 15, 20, 30 percent on the announcements of these deals and then rallying another 20, 30, 40 percent in the following weeks. And then when we got that big pullback in late February, early March, a lot of these SPACs are now down 50, 60 percent from their all time highs, which was only a couple months ago. So I think a lot of us learned the lesson that we were chasing these stocks higher. You know, I'll take some blame for that where I was. 
I guess call it falling in love with the story, you know, getting excited about what this company could be in five to 10 years and not wanting to miss it. Uh, and be, you know, my, my willingness to overpay a little bit in the beginning, um, was, was probably too, you know, I was too willing. So I was jumping into these SPACs, you know, what's, you know, Matterport and Latch and, uh, Line Electric and Proterra and a lot of these companies that could be massive winners over the next decade, but I was losing sight of, of the valuation. And, you know, once valuations were clearly stretched in, you know, mid to late February, and then you had, um, you know, the shorts coming in pretty hard and heavy and punishing some of these stocks without the retail investors being willing to, you know, go in and support the prices you know, a lot of these stocks just w went into free fall mode and there really wasn't anyone there to, you know, to catch the falling knife. So, you know, these stocks, you know, I'm not in skills, you know, skills was down, I think 60, 70%, desktop metal was down 60, 70%. I mean, these are still great businesses that have a, a very bright future, but retail, you know, these high retail ownership stocks were the first ones to get just, you know, massacred by the shorts. So, Hopefully a lot of that is behind us. You know, hopefully a lot of these stocks have found a bottom. You know, the buyers have seemed to come back into some of them. You know, whether that whether that's buyers that just had cash sitting around waiting for this pullback or whether we're starting to see money rotate out of some of those large cap stocks or the recovery stocks, which to me seem overheated. You know, the whole trade, uh, you know, piling into these these were the recovery stocks, you know, the airlines, the hotels, the restaurants, you know, the infrastructure stocks, I, you know, even the energy stocks and the banks, the financials, I feel like that trade is going to come to an end pretty soon. And you'll see a little bit of that money come back into small cap growth, just given the, the pullback and, you know, that valuations now look more fair. It's difficult to value these businesses. How do you value these small and, you know, how do you get sure about when to buy? It's, it is very difficult, you know, and I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, the individual investor and their risk tolerance and time horizon. You know, if you're a swing trader, for instance, um, which I'm not, but yeah, I mean, you could probably make some money in these stocks, but you're probably not really focused on valuation in the first place. I mean, you're probably looking for, you know, technical trends, you know, for someone like myself, I, you know, I, I consider myself a you know, a fundamental guy. So I am looking at the, the revenues and the earnings, but like you said, I mean, a lot of these small cap growth stocks, at least the, the ones that are still, you know, seeing accelerated growth, they don't have earnings yet. So you can't use a traditional price to earnings mm -hmm. model, which is why so many people have started using price to sales and price to sales is great. I mean, it's, it's one way that you can compare similar companies to one another, but even that has to change, you know, based on industry, and gross margins and, you know, a lot of other factors. So, you know, I've always said, I mean, so, so like the tricky part with price to sales, I mean, you could look at a software company that has 70% gross margins, uh, like a, an audio eye, which is one of my holdings. And then you could look at another, you know, stock, like let's say open door or Redfin, um, where the margins are, you know, 15 to 25%. I think open door is actually single digits on gross margin. So, so you can't like, so, and then even e-commerce, you know, I mean, there are e-commerce companies out there that have gross margins in the, you know, the twenties and thirties. Mm. I mean, so you can't compare them on a price to sales multiple to a, you know, a software company that might have margins in the sixties, seventies or eighties. So, so you have to be able to build these models and make them, you know, kind of uh, industry or sector specific. And I still use, so, the other tricky part with small caps is you really don't have much uh, assistance from the analysts. You know, if you take a large cap stock like Facebook, Amazon, um, I mean, they might have 40 consensus or 50 buzz. analysts that cover them. So you can get consensus numbers for this year, next year, and probably three or four years out. Mm. You know, if you're investing in small cap stocks, I mean, you're lucky to find a stock that has three or four analysts. You know, so maybe you get some consensus this year, maybe consensus next year, but you're talking a much wider gap between the, the highs and the lows on those numbers. So you have to be able to do some of that work yourself. Um, but I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I don't think investors should be trying to, you know, just 
guess on numbers so much. Um, you know, I try to speak with, so before I take a position in the company, I do reach out to management. I do reach out to investor relations. I do reach out to the analysts that actually cover that stock. And I even reach out to some of the fund managers that already have positions in that company. And I try to talk to all of them, you know, and then based on that, I can try to come up with some of my own numbers and see how those numbers, you know, match up with the consensus numbers that are out there. Um, you know, one of my stocks recently that I wrote about called Intrusion, they're a cybersecurity company, and they recently got hit by a short report. But I'm not concerned right now about the short report because I realized that the short, you know, the shorts are trying to make money in the short term. I mean, there's only two reasons that you see a short report on a stock, and they're both based on money. One is because the firm that's putting out the report has a short position or owns put options, or two, they're being paid by another firm that has a short position in that stock. So one of them is trying to, you know, profit from that stock price going down. But at the end of the day, those short reports are really just short term noise. I mean, there's been short reports published on Shopify, Peloton, Celsius, Grow Generation, and dozens of other companies that have, you know, gone on to see 500 or 1000% returns you know, in the following years after the short report. So, you know, if you really know the stock, you've had a chance to actually talk to management and investor relations, those short reports shouldn't concern you so much in the short term. You just have to hope that your due diligence was correct and that the fundamentals that you expect to play out actually play out. And in the case of intrusion, because I think I understand the story and I, I, I believe I know where fundamentals are going over the next two years, you know, the stock selling off 30% on a short report is nothing more than a buying opportunity for me. So, and that's, that's assuming that management is being honest, investor relations is being honest, you know, if they're misleading me and giving me false numbers, you know, that's a different story. Let's, let, let's talk about uh, some of the ideas. What, what's your million dollar bet, Jonah? What will you say? The stock that's in my portfolio right now that I think has the potential to deliver the best returns over the next five or 10 years is still a stock called Dermtech. Uh, so Dermtech, it's a California-based company, and they created these uh, genomics smart patches or stickers, as some people call them. They're about the size of a quarter. And what they're meant to do is help patients or dermatologists uh, detect skin cancer without having to use a biopsy. So it's these little patches. So, you know, typically if you go to your dermatologist and you have a suspicious looking mole, which is called a pigmented lesion, um, the dermatologist would either, you know, look at it with his eye, you know, or perhaps under a, uh, you know, magnifying glass or those little special glasses they wear, or they would take a picture of it. And then next time you come back, you know, they would take another picture and compare the two. But either way, none, you know, neither one of those is really scientific. Um, the other option is biopsy. So if they think that the mole looks suspicious, they can order a biopsy where they're basically cutting off a piece of the mole or the entire mole to analyze it. Uh, and every year in the US, there's over 4 million biopsies, but 90% of those biopsies come back negative, which is great. It means the person doesn't have cancer right now, but it also means that you know, over 3.5 million people have an unnecessary biopsy done to their body. So what Dermtech is doing is creating these patches that would essentially replace those unnecessary biopsies. So instead of getting a biopsy, you know, every time there's a, a suspicious mole in your body, they could use one of these patches to basically pull off the skin cells. And then those, you know, that patch with those skin cells get shipped off to California to Dermtech's lab, for, for analyzing, and they're able to tell, you know, with 99% accuracy, uh, if there's anything to be worried about in those skin cells. Um, and that's called their PLA product. And then they're now launching PLA plus, which is even more sensitive because it adds another indicator. And then later this year, Dermtech is going to launch a product called Luminate, uh, which is their kind of skin their skin analysis product for consumers. So, you know, we all know that, um, you know, too much exposure to the sun is bad for your skin and it can cause problems down the road, including skin cancer. So what Dermtech is doing is creating this product that's gonna allow people to have their skin analyzed um, so they can try to detect any of these problems as early as possible. Because, you know, the, 
the recovery rate from skin cancer is very, very high if you catch it early enough, you know, and that's probably true for any cancer, but once it starts to spread, you know, the, the mortality rate obviously goes up considerably. So the, the idea with DermTech is to try to use these non-invasive patches to detect skin cancer as early as possible, get it treated, get it removed so that you can go on to live a, you know, long, healthy, happy life. And the insurance companies are on board now too. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, some of their, you know, they're split up. Blue Cross Blue Shield is split up into like 30 or 32 different organizations, or I think they call it federations. Uh, Several of them have come out in support of Dermtex patch. Uh, The patch is supported by Medicare and Medicaid. So, you know, what Dermtex now has to do is convince the dermatologists to use the patch before the scalpel. You know, because if you're a dermatologist, you know, you went through school and internship and residency and all of that, you know, you learned that, you know, biopsy is the best way to determine if you have, you know, cancerous cells on your body, you know, to get those dermatologists to now shift to something new. It's, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, but that's where the opportunity is for investors like me and others that are willing to get into these stocks early you know, before you get mass adoption, right? I mean, once you get mass adoption, forget it. I mean, the stocks, the stocks are ripping at that point. But if you're willing to get in early, uh, you know, while the company is trying to get this product into the dermatologist offices, uh, the, as you see adoption, that's when you see the stock price, uh, you know, put up some pretty significant returns for shareholders. So DermTech is one of them. ClearPoint is another. ClearPoint is a, is a real-time MRI imaging system that'll be used for three main things. So minimally invasive brain surgery, DBS, which is deep brain stimulation, and then drug delivery to the brain. So I believe there is 50 or 100 different drug companies that are working on, you know, drugs for, you know, different neurological diseases that would require ClearPoint as the delivery system for those drugs to very specific points in the brain. Um, so those are two of my favorite companies right now and two of my biggest positions. You know, I still have big positions in Upstart, which is an, an AI-enabled underwriting platform or underwriting technology that is being licensed and used by uh, regional banks. So, mm. you know, you have your, you know, you have your big, your big national banks like Bank of America and JP Morgan, you know, they have the resources where if they wanted to actually build a better you know, AI underwriting system, they could do it. Um, but there's thousands of these smaller regional banks, um, community banks, credit unions that might have 10, 20, $30 billion in assets, but they don't really, I mean, <laughs> they're not going to, they're not going to spend, uh, you know, millions of dollars to develop their own AI. They're not going to, you know, they don't have the people, they just don't have the expertise, Um, You know, Upstart was started by some guys from Google. They've been working on this for the last seven years. They have billions and billions of data points on, you know, borrowers and payments. Um, And that's what enables the AI to continue improving over time. You know, the more data points you have, the better your AI model can become. And the traditional underwriting model is, is FICO scores. You know, FICO scores really haven't changed in 30 years. Uh, And what what this AI model from Upstart does is use 1,600 data points on each individual. And they're able to analyze all of that in seconds and return a, you know, decision to the the potential borrower. And, you know, what the system has been able to do is, you know, for the, the banks that use Upstart for their underwriting, it's allowed them to underwrite twice as many loans uh, without increasing the default rate. And if you're able to do that, then that bank is able to, you know, si- significantly increase their revenues because that's what the banks are in. Banks are in the business to do lending. I mean, that's where they make most of their money. You know, they bring in deposits, those deposits sit there, and then the bank wants to lend them out and make money on the, you know, the spread. Um, so banks want to keep lending, but they realize that, you know, these FICO scores is a very outdated way of doing things. And, you know, Upstart's AI model really is the future. And right now they've only been doing personal loans, but now they're getting into auto loans. And then I suspect in the next couple of years, we'll see mortgages and home equity loans and uh, small business loans. 
credit cards, student loans. So there's a ton of opportunity for Upstart to expand into additional credit, credit verticals. Talk, can you talk about your biggest loss and how did that happen? Uh, uh, okay, so probably a couple. Uh, I mean, in terms of like dollar amount, uh, it was probably, there's, there's been a few. Um, one was Fastly last year when, you know, I was really bullish on Fastly, ticker symbol FSLY, yeah. uh, starting last spring when the stock was, I think I first got into Fastly around $30 a share and it became my largest position in my portfolio along with Lavongo. And I was very bullish on Fastly because they worked with a lot of these high growth, innovative companies like yeah. Etsy, Shopify, Spotify, Airbnb. Um, but their biggest customer was TikTok. And as soon as the Trump organization announced that they were going to be banning TikTok, Fastly stock got pounded. Um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, I had trimmed a little bit of the position as the stock rallied, but uh, I got, you know, I lost. 30 or 40% on that position within a couple of days off of that news. So that was one of them. And then I, so that was, that was my loss. That was my biggest loss in 2020. My biggest loss in 2021, it was either, it was uh, intrusion, you know, which I talked about early, yeah. right? Cause they got, they got hit 30% on the short report. And even though the company came out and issued a statement, you know, refuting the, the short, you know, the information that was in the short report, you know, like it's still, like the company can't say anything to recover that 30% right away. You know, the only thing the company can do is put up the numbers that they say they're going to put up. And if they do, then the story will play out the way that I want it to. And the stock will go much, much higher. And anybody that sold the stock based on the short report will obviously regret that sale. Um, so I still have a six and a half percent position in intrusion because I'm betting on what the company has already told me uh, about their new product and the new customer numbers that they're seeing. Um, the other, the other big one, the other big loss this year, which I also talked about a few minutes ago was Transmedics where, you know, they created these organ care systems. So OCS called OCS unit. Uh, so for anyone that doesn't know, you know, the organ transport transplant market has always been, uh, has, has always used this old technology which is called the ice cooler. I mean, that's that's honestly how they transport organs uh, right now between hospitals. It's it's in an ice cooler, which is called cold storage. Uh, lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, all of it. And the problem is, you know, the longer that those organs stay on ice, the faster they die, um, and it makes it very difficult to transport an organ more than a couple hours without that organ you know, dying or decaying to a point where it's, it's now unusable by the time it gets to the recipient, right? So that recipient is, you know, basically, you know, waiting for a year, two years, three years for an organ. And now they have to worry about that organ getting to them before it dies because of cold storage. So Transmedics has been working on these machines for the last 15 plus years. Uh, and they've, they've already gotten FDA approval on OCS lungs, uh, and it's literally enabled them to, you know, um, harvest organs from someone on the East Coast, right, after they die, and then put them in the OCS unit and transport those organs all the way over to the West Coast and have those organs show up and be, be able to be used because these machines are pumping uh, blood and oxygen and nutrients through these organs while they're on the, the organ care system. And it's allowing the transport specialists to monitor these organs in real time, to literally see the vitals, you know, how fast is the heart beating, how, what's the blood flow, right? Everything that, everything you need to know to make sure that that organ is still in the right condition for the recipient patient. So it's just amazing technology. I mean, these are the sorts of companies that I, that I really feel good about supporting because they are doing good things for the world and humanity and science. But unfortunately, when we when we had the FDA hearing a couple of weeks ago, even though the vote was positive overall, the comments were still sort of negative. You know, there were comments saying that 
you know, the trials weren't really conducted that well. There wasn't, you know, there's no long-term data. There weren't more, there weren't more animal studies done. And it sounded like the, even the people that voted yes, because they still think overall OCS is better than cold storage. It sounded like they were basically saying, you know, for, for shorter distances, you know, under four hours of drive time, uh, you can still get away with using cold storage. So, you know, they sort of said we would still recommend transmedics being used in, trans in transport, but only four hours or more. And if, that, if that's what the FDA decision comes down as in a, in a couple months, then it, it does shrink the, the total adjustable market Right. I mean, let's just, you know, if there is 100,000 and there's not that many, so let's say 10,000, you know, organ transplants every year, uh, you know, maybe instead of those 10,000 using OCS, maybe now it's only, you know, 3,000. So, you know, it, it was a bearish, there was a bearish tone mm. to the comments. Sure. So the stock sold off, you know, 25%, and I lost, you know, 25 grand or a uh, one one particular thing which has given you you know a lovely huge gain which you're really happy about um i mean my yeah i mean i'm i'm still up i think i'm up 65 percent year to date still oh, so really? even, yeah <laughs> i mean e even though i'm way off my highs i mean i'm still up 65 percent year to date and the main reason is because of upstart and futu you know i mean i i wrote about upstart and futu back in december on my Substack newsletter, when both stocks were under forty dollars, and mm -hmm. those were my those are my two biggest positions coming into this year. So you know, those two have carried my portfolio this year. Um, you know, and and even Mohawk. So I wrote about Mohawk in, back in mid December when the stock was at twelve, and now it's at twenty four. So I've, I mean, I've also had a double on Mohawk. Now, I mean, I. I mean, I have money coming into my account every week through different businesses. So I'm constantly adding more money to my investment portfolio. So, I mean, I've still lost money on Mohawk overall because I was, I was adding too much on the way up. And even DermTech, you know, I got into DermTech in the 30s. I added in the 40s. I added in the 50s. It rallied up to 84 and then pulled all the way back into the 30s again. So, you know, I'm still technically underwater a little bit on Mohawk and Dermtech, but I still love both of these companies for the next three or four years. So I'm, I'm not going to sell them for the tax loss because uh, I think they could rip higher at any point. You know, we, we could wake up tomorrow and both those stocks could be up 10% very easily versus Transmedics, where I don't think Transmedics goes 10% higher until we get to that FDA decision, which might be two months away. So that's where I have to decide when I want to when I want to take tax losses and when I don't because I don't want to I don't want to take a tax loss have to sit on the sidelines for thirty one days and miss and end up missing a Mr. big cap rally. Mr. Rally. No. So so yeah so so food to an upstart are my they've been my two saviors this year. How do you manage uh, you know this this COVID there's you know you're you're investing high pressure stocks. I mean, uh, how do you manage, you know, mental health and, you know, how do you manage your sanity? <laughs> uh, I go to the gym every day or I try to go every day, which definitely helps. Um, I don't even own a car. So okay. I actually ride, I ride my bike, you know, which forces me to get outside, get some fresh air, get some exercise. So I literally ride my bike to the gym. I ride my bike to the grocery store, uh, to the coffee shop, wherever I'm going, I'm on my bike and it just, it's good. I mean, I take a couple bike rides a day, you know, it gets the blood flowing, it gets the endorphins going, gets me to clear my head. I'll do this even in the winter time, literally in the middle of January, 25 degrees out and I'm on my bike, you know, riding through town with, you know, uh, a, a mask on, a scarf, gloves, everything. So uh, that's, that's one way that helps me. But I mean, I'm also in this for the long game. You know, I'm 40 years old. I don't need this money for the next 20 years. Um, so if I can find these, you know, high growth, disruptive young companies, and I'm, I'm willing to be patient and wait for the, you know, the story to play out, then I, I don't have to worry about what they do in the short term. You know, what my stocks do today or tomorrow or next week really doesn't impact my life in any way. It might make some of my subscribers happier or sad, 
But for me personally, like if, if Derm Tech trades up to 50 next week, I'm not selling it anyway. So why does it even matter? Right. I mean, it makes my it makes my year to date performance look better, but it doesn't change anything for me. So and I, I just think that's if you're going to be investing in these high growth, volatile, small cap companies, you, you have to have that mindset. You have to be focused on the next three years, five years, 10 years. Otherwise, this, you know, this space or sector, uh, you know, this asset class, whatever you want to call it, is just going to drive you insane because it's just, it's like a, you know, I, I compare it to riding a roller coaster with your eyes closed. Um, you know, every day you're getting like whipped around, you don't know which way you're going some days, but, you know, if you can stay focused on, uh, you know, on the long term, then, then you can make some significant money in these stocks. Uh, let's keep in touch. And thank you so much, Jonah. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.